If you've been playing video games for more than 15 years now, there's a 100% chance you've played Guitar Hero at least once in your life. Or something derived from it. The series was once an icon of rhythm gaming that took the mainstream media by storm at the tail end of this industry's sixth generation, but it fell into complete obscurity before the seventh even ended. There are many reasons why this cultural movement ended up in the land of irrelevance, which I'll get into later, but I'm more interested in the company behind those original titles, Harmonix Music Systems Incorporated, and the competition they inherently created for themselves to fight with a later creation. Almost like a monster that you lost control of, which you're forced to take on by creating... another monster? Are there any movies like that? Probably. Voted by my rockin' patrons, this video will be a mostly personal take on Harmonix, for I believe they're one of the most genuine and soulful game companies in the industry, proof being their portfolio of rhythm titles. We'll also touch on how their first mega hit would severely lose its way once they were out of the picture. But before we get started, I just want to emphasize a few things. A. I won't really dive into the music or how my tastes reflect on them because it's not really relevant to the topic at hand. B. I'm not that great at playing. I think I'm alright, but I could never really fully master the way these games are desired to be played, never mind the terrible sync issues I sometimes have to deal with. And C. Regarding the structure, I'm primarily focusing on the main titles between these two particular franchises. I'm also going in assuming everyone knows the basics of how the games function and play. Harmonix is an East Coast American game company that's been around since 1995. Started by the likes of Alex Rogopoulos and Aaron Egozi, this company had very humble beginnings with one goal in mind, to inspire people that loved music but weren't exactly motivated to pick up an instrument and start wailing on it. This, of course, stemmed from other rhythm games that were already making waves in the industry. It wasn't until a few years into the business that the first music games started to appear. Games like Dance Dance Revolution and Beat Mania. For me, the big one was Parappa the Rapper. I started playing it and just had a grin on my face from beginning to end. Rhythm action was an incredibly compelling framework for us to pursue, bringing that joy of music making to the world. It would take 10 years for them to reach notoriety with a mostly original game blowing up more than they could have imagined. Before that, they experimented heavily with games of a rather smaller scope. The more notable titles during this time, Frequency and Amplitude, would feature famous artist contributions thanks to Sony's support and publishing power. These games would plant the seeds for their biggest endeavors, even if they didn't realize it. As you can see here, each strip represented a different instrument for the track you're playing. This came from their desire to change how people would see music. Normally, the way you think of music is that it's sitting flat in front of you. Maybe it's on a sheet of paper as musical notation, but we added a third dimension and have you traveling through the music. We essentially started developing some core concepts around it, not even necessarily knowing what the game would be, but just knowing that this was the visual representation that we wanted for our music playground. Frequency, and more so its sequel, would get Harmonix's foot in the door of the game's industry and expand on their potential as developers. Come Red Octane, a company that developed peripherals for rhythm games by Japanese corporation Konami, and helped expand Western interest in titles like Dance Dance Revolution. Sony formed the connection between the two companies as Red Octane wanted to make a Western rhythm game with a Western developer, as this genre was primarily conquered by those from Japan. The name Guitar Hero started swimming around in their minds after initially discussing a peripheral for their past games, Frequency and Amplitude. These two companies would end up creating an original rhythm game that came in this big old box. Huh. Seemed bigger when I was 15. I remember the conversations. We were looking at all the reasons not to do it, which includes peripheral based games were never commercially successful, at least in the US. Same for music games. So you marry one genre that's never successful with another genre that's never successful. That's not a recipe for success. 
Many were doubtful of this game's success, most importantly companies that refused to publish it. That includes Acclaim, a seasoned yet fledging game development company which likely didn't realize they turned down what could have been their saving grace. This led to Harmonix's own guitar peripheral manufacturing company, Red Octane, to publish the game themselves. It was a really big risk for the parties involved, but the result was an even bigger payoff. I think it helps that the game itself was great too. Besides the enjoyment of hitting rhythmic notes and bearing a very fair learning curve, the goofy caricatures and exaggerated stunts made it even more fun to learn and master these tracks. This was something Harmonix was missing when it came to frequency and amplitude. The games are just a tad too disconnected from relatability. Looking back, it almost feels like space aliens made these games. The cartoonish depiction of rowdy rockers climbing their way to fame throughout these shows in Guitar Hero was extremely charming, helping it stand out from the somewhat more sterilized rhythm games before it. This would give the players a sense of attachment and relatability, adding to the experience. Guitar Hero managed to sell over 2 million copies, blasting away their expectations. This was unheard of for a game peripheral bundle that cost $90, but Harmonix and Red Octane put their faith in Guitar Hero, where both parties were confident of their financial death if it didn't sell well. This led them to immediately work on a sequel. Building off the engine and assets of the original game and sticking to PlayStation 2 meant they were able to dish out this title pretty quickly as it launched, for all intents and purposes, exactly one year later. It seems the recognition they received with the first game got more record license holders to reach out in order to provide enough tracks for new installments, some even offering master recordings. Like the first game, this one came bundled with a Fisher-Price looking guitar toy. While I'm sure it wouldn't have been a problem for them to sell the game alone, which as far as I can tell was never the case when talking brand new sealed copies, I imagine the developers wanted to encourage returning players to get their buds together for co-op or versus action without resorting to either player sticking with a regular controller. And seeing how quickly this game released, it's possible they were doing this to support people that wanted to get good multiplayer action going in the first place but didn't know another person that bit the bullet with them the first time around. While I'm sure a more cynical mindset would say they were just being greedy, I think Harmonix and Red Octane ran the release this way to heavily encourage people to get together and enjoy Guitar Hero in groups. The sequel would include a co-op mode in which the second guitarist would play the bass line. This serves as a precursor to what Harmonix wanted to do with the quickly growing franchise and an early sign of things to come. So, while Guitar Hero 2 did well in sales, the Xbox 360 was already showing everyone what the next generation was like and this came out on a PlayStation 2 like 10 seconds before that console's successor hit shelves. This situation brought about a very particular company and a huge caveat that Harmonix may not have expected. Red Octane saw opportunity with the series, dipping its toes in the seventh generation, porting Guitar Hero 2 with some extra songs and the option for downloadable content, and this was a really big deal for those that were more interested in getting a nice, crisp HD experience with their gaming instead of dusting off an old PlayStation 2. This port was made possible through the power of Activision and blew up the franchise exponentially. So this wasn't just a one-time thing for them, as they saw huge potential with this franchise that barely got started. Activision bought out Red Octane, which included the rights to the franchise, entirely through this deal as they sought out to own the manufacturers of the guitar peripherals. Seeing as how the Xbox 360 version's Explorer guitar is still to this day considered the best one to use, that was an understandable decision. However, Harmonix was not part of this deal, ultimately left on the wayside. This meant a new opportunity to start fresh as well as rebrand in a matter of sorts. Harmonix struck a deal with MTV Games for Publishing, which is definitely the company you want supporting you when your game revolves around licensed music. Despite getting forced out of the Guitar Hero franchise, Harmonix took their plans for that series to spring a big leap onto this new game. After all, you can't just make it only about guitars again for a third home console entry. That would be ridiculous. Huh. Their game and direct competitor to the series they birthed in the first place would be called Rock Band. And as the name implies, it's more than just guitar. Now you can have up to four people play at once with a guitarist, bassist, drummer, and singer. 
This was a massive move for Harmonix, for they never created anything this grand in scale, both creatively and financially. Rock Band's production added up to about $200 million as it was set up to be a high-profile rhythm game that only sold in gigantic bundles for 2007's holiday season. Thankfully, this also proved to be a big success for them, showing that heavy marketing and expansion of the core concept was able to stand against Guitar Hero, which quickly became a household name. At the time, this was the series I decided to follow, being aware of Harmonix and their aspirations. Around my teenage years, I started to understand what it meant to pay attention to specific game developers rather than the game series itself or the publisher. While Guitar Hero experts stuck with that series, possibly for the more challenging tracks, the joy of multiplayer romps was much more appealing to me. So, with new ways to play and a crazy mixture of music from many genres, there were two other features to speak of. Firstly, customizable characters. While there are some presets that became iconic within the community, they really wanted to make you feel more part of the band by making a character of your own, whether they look like you or not. The visual style of Rock Band, which would remain consistent throughout the majority of the franchise, went for a more grounded approach. I wouldn't say realistic, since they've still got cartoonish features, but it was different from Guitar Hero's characters, distinguishing the experience even further. The cleaner presentation and believable stunts your characters would perform on stage added to the immersion, making it feel like a more heartfelt experience, something you would better relate to. There's also DLC, with rhythm gaming being pretty much the only genre where it's perfectly acceptable to provide weekly downloadable content, each week saw at least one new song you can purchase to add to your library. Sometimes they'd even release entire albums. It was insane. In a good way. The ever-expanding library added so much replay value, especially amongst friends that played together. While Guitar Hero 3, its direct competitor, was definitely the more appropriate option for the rhythm gamer looking for a heavy challenge and one-on-one -on -one competition, Rock Band was much more about having a good time with friends, both online and offline. Not to say some of these tracks won't give you a run for your money. Oh, I'm so bad at this. The sequel would arrive about a year later, with more options in regards to purchasing the game, including a standalone copy. While it didn't take many strides in its core gameplay or mechanics, they expanded on its online features, adding a versus mode where you could do one-on-one -on -one battles against people using the same instrument. Harmonix also gave great consideration for both sides of this community they're building. For people that already owned Rock Band 1 and Getting 2, they were able to transfer the first game's library into the new title. And for people sticking to the first rock band, they were able to continue enjoying any DLC being released. It's crazy, I feel like any other company would have simply made new content only available for the new game. But for multiple years, all of the official DLC they would release weekly were compatible for both games. I know this seems like an odd thing to focus on, but I was just really amazed by the company's flexibility and inclusivity in regards to how players were taking in their product. Meanwhile, its direct competitor was Guitar Hero World Tour, and was more of a means of Activision playing catch-up by making it about the entire band this time, but still mostly focusing on guitar-centric songs. They also added this strange create-a-song feature that was interesting in some ways, but most of the time just sounded like ear-gouging crap. But hey, it was free, so if you wanted shitty canned guitar recreations of Nintendo songs, be my guest. Well, you can't be my guest because its servers are gone. Meanwhile, Harmonix made the absolutely batshit insane decision that just happened to up the ante to this. They added the Rock Band Network, which, skipping all the nitty and gritty, was a means for small bands across the world to get their own original music into the game for literally anyone across the world to download. Well on Xbox 360. This portion of the game was very limited for the other platforms. Clearly it wasn't easy for Harmonix to get this kind of project off the ground in the first place. 
an opportunity for any band to get their music in such a big game series and even get a cut of the sales revenue, what better way for this game series about touring across the world as a ramshackle band to connect with other people basically trying to do the same thing? Maybe this kind of thing wasn't clear to everyone, especially not outsiders looking in, who I'm sure only saw two fat cows getting milked mercilessly. While I definitely saw merciless milking from one end, the other end seemed like an intelligent strategy in keeping a series relevant and that cow happy. At least to their best ability. Pretty surprising considering they're working under the likes of EA and MTV. Here's the thing, you're either cool or you're not. That's what it is. I think Harmonix was cool all the way up until around Rock Band 2, and then after that we were trying to be cool. Again, that's just trying to survive because Activision were being dicks. There's no other way around it. It's clear if you sit back and look that Activision decided they would rather sink the ship than share the ground. Do you know what I mean? Where Guitar Hero saw crappy peripheral handheld spin-offs, sequel and side piece development on the same level as yearly sports games, Rock Band would receive new unique entries that either changed up the way you'd enjoy the game, or projects that not only had their own mechanics and style, but their exclusive set lists can be added to the mainline titles in order to beef up the players' main library even more. Well, except for Beatles Rock Band. I'm sure that was a lot of licensing hoo-ha. But speaking more on band-centric games, this is also a point of comparison between the two franchises. While there's obviously heaps of fan service to go around on all counts, the pieces Harmonix made for the Beatles and Green Day felt much more sincere and pouring with dedication to these bands. The importance of their history was clear as day. The never-released recordings of the members at the studio during the loading screens, the unique angles and visuals they use while you play to recreate various music videos or live performances, and that stupendous timeline that encapsulates the magic and excitement these bands provided. The band-centric games were love letters filled to the brim with passion from said band in every way imaginable. Compare that to the band-centric entries in Guitar Hero that felt more sterile, more samey between each other, and none of them had enough confidence in those bands to keep the track list exclusive to their work. We also can't forget the buckles such as utilizing iconic artists for the character roster that led to suit-worthy gems such as this. These dedications don't feel like they have nearly as much heart or love put into them. It was really something to witness when you were following a particular franchise. I'm trying to put personal bias aside for this and looking at these two monsters more objectively. But no matter how I sliced it, there was just an otherworldly difference in pure quality these two companies were pursuing. And all I was able to see was overcompensation when it came to Activision and how they were trying to handle Guitar Hero. It became an IP. Guitar Hero lost all of its soul. It didn't matter what the songs were, it was just whatever is going to look good on the back of the box. They literally said that. So it didn't matter. I fought so hard for music selection, and they just wouldn't listen. Harmonix only seeked evolution for this series' core design without uprooting the entire thing. The way they did that was fit in one more instrument for Rock Band 3, keyboard. With this and the Beatles' debut harmony vocals, this brought the potential multiplayer mayhem to a whopping seven performers during a single song. Absolutely incredible that these madmen pulled this off. Something that folks might say was too ambitious was including a pro guitar mode with its own peripherals made for this entry. This was essentially a teaching tool for the player to learn the actual strings of the songs, blurring the line between simply playing a video game and developing a skill for the instrument. Of course, in my opinion, this was a little too early, for the peripheral guitar was very expensive, and it's not like you could just plug in your own six string and get to playing, a feature that would have been a game changer and something Ubisoft managed to pull off very well about a year later with Rocksmith. The only new feature Guitar Hero did for this entry was... narration, I guess? A moment of doubt. The beast strikes. The guitar, ancient and powerful, is banished to a cavern deep and foreboding. Defenseless, he succumbs. He calls out for help. Ears are needed to find ancient weapon and release the hero. Rock Band 3 had its own crack at a story mode to match. This is another example where I see nothing but pure heart and soul coming from Harmonix. 
The character creation feature was established since the beginning of this series, and I'm sure a lot of people grew connected to those rock stars they made, so much that they probably try to replicate them for the next entry as they were following these games. With Rock Band 3, your original character creations received much more attention, occupying the loading screens, chilling in the background of the menus, and they were also the stars of the brand new story mode. It's a simple tale, of course, and doesn't have any dialogue. It's just a story about a group of friends, your characters trying to make it out there as a band. You see their humble beginnings all the way to ultimate stardom. I absolutely adore how this was pulled off, seeing them come to life in this way. When me and my friends made these characters and saw them finish their first gig, I choked up. How could something so minimal make me feel this way? I think a lot of it had to do with how connected we were to this series and these characters over the years. Harmonix was able to use that deep connection we had to hit us on this kind of emotional level, which was just stunning to think about. Anyway, what did Guitar Hero do? More overcompensation, trying to turn this into some weird epic and even have it narrated by geriatric rock star Gene Simmons who sounds really tired the entire time. In a cavern deep and foreboding, behold the guitar. I really don't see what people are supposed to take from something so obnoxious. Obviously Guitar Hero's roots come from parodying and embellishing the rock and roll aesthetic, but this was just going way too far in my opinion. In the end, these two franchises had such a startling difference in execution to me. With Harmonix, I saw ambition, heart, and ingenuity with their installments, clear notions that they wanted to always do right by the fans and pieces they could be proud of while still keeping the series relevant. I'm sure there were nudges by the likes of EA and MTV that they had to please as well, so it wasn't all perfect. Meanwhile, with Guitar Hero and Neversoft, I only saw their efforts as obnoxious and aimless. They clearly weren't sure how to handle this series, essentially throwing anything they can muster against the wall to see what sticks, only to stare at a blank canvas as the series would shutter its doors and officially get shelved less than a year after this last game was released. Oh, and for good measure, Activision killed off both Neversoft and Red Octane right after the launch. Something worth bringing up is the relationship these two games had with each other, knowing early on how deep the rivalry was between them. The most these two reached an agreement was cross-compatibility with their own instruments, meaning if you had the guitar peripheral for a Guitar Hero 3, it would work for Rock Band. Even the drum sets from Rock Band 1 or 2 would work on Guitar Hero World Tour, which meant a complete remapping of the tracklist, so that was cool of them. What wasn't cool was Activision nabbing exclusivity rights to various bands, which even included retroactively removing songs from exports of old Rock Band set lists. This was the case for bands such as Soundgarden, Metallica, and Red Hot Chili Peppers. This always seemed like a major dick move as only a few of these songs even managed to be restored for later installments. It's no coincidence that around the time these songs were getting delisted, Activision was announcing or releasing games and large DLC packs for said bands. One that would never see the light of day was for Chili Peppers, but it was in production. However, after a few solid years of weekly DLC and even a spin-off title that called back to their Amplitude days, Harmonix would close this chapter in the middle of 2013 with one final piece of DLC being American Pie by Don McLean. Ominous. The two franchises would rest for a few years before returning for the new generation with Rock Band 4 and Guitar Hero Live. The general audience considered these games to be underwhelming returns for various reasons. Regarding Rock Band, Harmonix shrunk the scope of the game, removing elements such as keyboard and pro guitar. In a way, it's understandable since this was their first main endeavor continuing the series independently after cutting ties with EA and MTV. Of course, particular elements would make a return for this entry as well as all of the previous content you've purchased for the past games, save for Rock Band Network songs. It was quite a process for Harmonix to take, but they didn't want to leave all that history behind. Those few dollars you spent 8 years ago? Well, they're still valid. The consideration they had for longtime fans was just wild. Then there was Guitar Hero Live by Freestyle Games. What a coincidence, right? Announced literally a month after Rock Band 4. 
However, they approached this as much more of a fresh start as nothing carried over to this new title, not even the plastic instruments. With a completely different guitar controller structure, omitted bass and drums topped off with all the previous DLC abandoned in favor of a subscription service that I talk more about, but it got shut down anyway. This doesn't really sound like it was made for the fans at all, but rather them trying to reinvent the wheel while uprooting what people loved about these games as a vain attempt to capture a completely different audience. The world of Guitar Hero that they spent so many years building, as dumb as a lot of it was, completely wiped in favor of... Full motion video, a posted video that isn't full motion. Man, I feel really bad for Guitar Hero fans. The only fun I got out of this game was seeing all the judgmental glares the actors would give me when I decided just to stop playing. This flaccid return led Activision to basically gut freestyle games with a machete, sell the remains to Ubisoft, and then axing the online services a few years after that. Meanwhile, Rock Band 4 to this day is still active with new songs every week. And from what I'm seeing, a lot of it is also them restoring songs that were lost due to Rock Band Network support ending with the third title's lifespan. Just another example of them showing support for the fans that helped them build this franchise. So, what else did Harmonix do? The company was solely focused on Rock Band between the development of the first game all the way to Rock Band 3. After that, they expanded greatly with all sorts of projects on many platforms. While not everything they seeked out to do came to fruition, it was so intriguing seeing this company evolve and experiment this much. Dance Central reinvented the idea of dance games and how its design can actually teach you choreography. Chroma was on track to make a unique spin on multiplayer arena shooters with rhythm-based mechanics. Amplitude on PS4 was a humble return to their roots. And there's Drop Mix, a tabletop mobile game hybrid that was basically Baby's first DJ set, which then saw a successor just last year with Fuser. This game has some of the deepest mechanics ever for a harmonics game, and it's even something actual live mixing DJs can get into. Trap drums. Trap queen. I mean, I hope it just doesn't feel like work to them. Everything you need to DJ in the video game space. And as a side note, it's really funny how this game doesn't use any sort of peripheral to play it, yet it's so much closer to emulating a DJ's experience than DJ Hero, a game that was little more than Guitar Hero with a different controller. Ha, ah, thought I forgot about that game, didn't ya? Harmonix is always working on really interesting projects, and everything they do revolves around rhythm and spirit. Even when I can't enjoy all of their works, like those fucking VR projects because I don't have a goddamn way to play it, I love just seeing what they're going to do next. But anyway, I sure talked about Guitar Hero and Rock Band a lot, but what is the point of all this? I guess I just wanted to show a clear-cut comparison to why one series felt more genuine than the other. A lot of Harmonix's DNA is made up of musicians in their own bands finding passion in game development. That's why the original Guitar Hero games and all of Rock Band feels more like it's about the music and the player. These people, once fledging bandmates, know what that's like and how to convey that in their games. Music made its way into everything in our corporate culture, probably to the detriment of the company as the years went on. Now that I work with other studios, I heard people complain that they never even applied to harmonics because they thought they had to be a musician. That may have even hurt us in ways we'll never know. But at least in the early days, it was nice to know that if you started talking about some random Fleetwood Mac B-side, almost everyone would know what you were talking about. Neversoft and Freestyle? While I'm sure many of the developers involved are fine, hard-working people, they don't have the same kind of perspective and weren't able to provide something that felt as relatable or personal. While Harmonix did get ridiculous with some of their presentation, Neversoft's Guitar Hero just felt like it was trying too hard most of the time. Never mind Activision forcing this franchise to pump out a new game every other week for a while. That's a whole other catastrophe. So, in the end, what will have a more lasting effect? Which series actually attempts to touch the hearts of those experiencing it? 
I think the answer is obvious at this point. Maybe I'm harping too much on how Rock Band got me at an emotional level, but it's always how I felt about this franchise. And while Harmonix isn't a perfect company, I don't think I've ever seen one be so genuine towards its audience and show love for them as much as they have over the years. The Guitar Hero games after 2, especially replaying them now, just don't give me that feeling at all. It's almost robotic how these titles were designed. But to be frank, that might not even be their fault. With how quickly they had to release these games, you can't really expect passion oozing out of every single one of these. Sadly, as much as I love Harmonix, I think something like Rock Band isn't really viable in today's market anymore. While I can't find hard numbers on their DLC sales, it seems as though the mainstream audience is simply interested in different things now, and the more hardcore players have moved on to different means of sharpening their rhythm gaming skills. While it might be too late for most people to even care about something like Rock Band now, I'll always remember its legacy and how the genuine love these creators expressed touched my heart back then. With that, they gained an eternal fan that will always be interested in rhythm-based gaming creativity that they're willing to dish out in the future. Thanks for watching. A big shout out to my old friends that played Rock Band with me for years. You know who you are. Big thanks to Sonic Kick for providing his voice for the video. Check out his channel through the link below. I'd also like to thank ECFU1990 for helping me get all the multiplayer footage. And of course, shout out to all my rockin' patrons. Thanks for voting on this side project. A new poll is happening right now and it only takes being a $1 patron to join in on the poll. I'd also like to introduce a new Baron of Brutality known as True Flambe. Flambay? True Flambe. Sounds like a really fancy dish. Ah yes, I'll have your finest true flambe. And a new cool ghoul in the ghost house known as Play Silver 2425. Hey, that sounds familiar. It also sounds like great advice. Play Silver 2425. Play Silver 2425. Play Silver 2425.